Hello, this is Nice Wander, and you're watching the Now Man Show, and I am here with Denny Tedesco, who is the producer and director of an excellent documentary about session musicians in LA called The Wrecking Crew. It's an award winning film. And thank you for being on the Now Man Show, thank Denny. You. It's a pleasure. Uh, now, what is The Wrecking Crew? How many people were in it? Well, The Wrecking Crew is a nickname that was given to these guys, actually many years later, supposedly. Um, they were, in the early 60s, the, the, these guys were studio musicians, there were maybe 15, 20 of them that were doing the rock and roll dates. The older guys didn't want to do some of those dates. There were maybe uh, demos, which were illegal for the union. So these guys would do these things that were maybe, you know, cash dates, where the older guys didn't want to take that chance. But the rock and roll dates, these guys would do them, they, even though they were jazzers themselves. Uh, my dad, Tommy Tedesco, was one of them, and he's 30 in 1960. Hal Blaine, uh, Don Randy, uh, piano player and owner of the Baked Potato. Carol Kay was the only woman in the group. There was Joe Osborne, another bass player. It was, but I, like I said, 15 to 20 different folks that were kind of in and out of the rock and roll date. And the reason they were called the Wrecking Crew supposedly said, the older guys said they're going to wreck the business playing this rock and roll stuff. <laughs> so, but uh, I think they went on to do something better than wrecking a business. Yeah, and, and they, they did all kinds of stuff too. I mean, they, they did the standards, right? They did the oh, pop, yeah, yeah. the I rock. Mean, they're, they're, the... They're, like I said, dad's 30 in 1960, so he's mm -hmm. coming out of, uh, he's born in 30, so as a kid he's listening to all the big bands. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these guys are beboppers, you know, Plaz Johnson, uh, the great sax man. You know, so some of the guys are country guys, like you got uh, uh, Leon Russell out of uh, Tulsa and mm -hmm, you got mm -hmm. um, Glenn Campbell out of Arkansas. It was one of the greatest melting pots of music in a weird way because you had black, you had you know white, you had Italian, you had classical, you had jazz, country, and a woman. You know, yeah, kind of mix, yeah. you know what I mean, mixing. Yeah. Um, and they all played together. But the reason they were so important at the time is the, in those days we only had one track it was mono mm -hmm. so everything mm -hmm. had to be everybody mm -hmm. had to nail it in that room so let's say a room like this the studio everybody had to be there 10 20 people um, you didn't have many tracks to go to so everybody from start the song to the end you better nail it because we got no over overdubbing time and they were allowed to do three or four songs in a, a three-hour session and that's what the union allowed them to do and then they would move on to another recording session so as Glenn Campbell said, he says, I was playing with uh, Michael Jordan, but everybody in the room was Michael Jordan. Yes. They were like, boom, 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 boom. You know, countdown, let's get it out. And um, if you couldn't keep up, you aren't coming back. Yes. Because you're blowing it not just for yourself, you're blowing it for all the other guys in the room. And now those guys, too, also were the first call musicians. Yeah, right? they were. For this, this is Phil Spector's Wall of Sound. Yeah. You know, you got Janet Dean using the guys. Janet Dean turns them on to Brian Wilson. And all this stuff starts, you know, now they become the guys. They become the A-team, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, where the older guys can't get in now yeah, into yeah. this because there's a groove going. You know, there was, you know the surf sound was happening at yes. the time. Um, but they were playing with also with... Uh, you know, Nat King Cole, they were also doing Sinatra, they were doing Dean Martin stuff, Sammy Davis Jr. stuff. Um, anything that was done here in LA most likely had a group of session musicians involved. You know, anything in that era. And we saw that that progress over time into the 70s, it's just an amazing, like it was, your, your it, father alone, what, played on thousands of songs? Yeah, Dad, I mean, in the 70s, what happens is the, this rock and roll session thing kind of ends towards the late 60s, I don't mean these guys st right. start moving on to other things. You have different, you know, bands coming in with their own bands that could play folk singers. You know, you had the um, uh, Carol King brings in James Taylor. They're doing their own thing. They don't need these guys anymore. That's right. Uh, '70s rolled around. It's a different era. Uh, Dad was fortunate. He went into TV. He was a TV and film. You know, he was constantly in demand because he could read music. Um, and he could play all those different instruments. You know, other guys went on the road, other guys, you know, went into teaching. But That's, Dad kept going. And some people did all of it, probably, yeah, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, as a musician, you just do whatever it takes to get, you know, get that paycheck. How many people would you say you interviewed uh, in total for this film? Probably about 80. Wow. Man, maybe, 
Yeah, probably about 80. And hours of hours footage. Of, yeah, footage. Wow. And then, like I said, there's six hours of bonus material on the DVD, and I just wanted their voices to be heard. And, you, and the, the, the Recce crew is, is such a wide variety of people, because I mean, you've got, you got guitarists, electric and acoustic, yeah. you've got bass players. Yeah, bla you, in those days, you had three bass players yeah. on the session. You would have uh, the stand-up, you would have uh, the Fender, and then you would have the Dan Electro, which was a guitar bass. And they were using those bass you know, to kind of cut through a lot of stuff. Uh, guitar players, you would have three or four guitar players. You would have my dad, maybe, Barney Kessel, the great mm -hmm, jazz player, mm -hmm. maybe Glenn Campbell, uh, B uh, Billy Strange, or James Burton. Yeah, there was yeah. a mixture of eight gu guitar players that you could go to. Uh, drummers are really just Hal Blaine, and uh, Earl Palmer were doing so much of it. And you had Jim Gordon as well, but those were the rock guys. And yeah, Earl yeah. Palmer comes from New Orleans in the late 50s. Exactly. Um, and the reason he left New Orleans, he did you know Little Richard stuff yeah. and um, Aretha. Didn't he do Aretha? Uh, no, I don't think he did much Aretha because but it, he, he did the jazz. Like he did with a lot of the jazz stuff, but he also did uh, Fats Domino. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. came out of New uh, New, New Orleans, Orleans because yeah. he was married to a white woman. That's right. He said I had you know so he was felt better about being in L.A. And once he started working here, it was nonstop. Who was probably the most challenging interview of, of all? Oh, God. <laughs> hey, 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 whoa, there's a tough one. Um, you know, everybody, I, I could go the other way. Who were the most surprising ones? I mean, for yeah. sure, I mean, uh, Jimmy Webb to me was one wow. of the greats. I mean, I always said you could take that tape, the 60 minute tape, and give it to an editor and just say a number between zero and 60. He was so poetic. So um, he could tell a story like no one could. Well, you know, he wrote what MacArthur Park exactly. and, I mean, and Galveston, and yeah. uh, how by the time I get to Phoenix, yeah, exactly. And, uh, I mean, very poetic. Lyrics, you know, and then you know. Brian, on the other hand, God bless him, Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson. Yeah. You know, Brian's a tough interview. Yes. And it's not because he's being tough. Brian just thinks in different ways. You yes, I, I've talked to him twice, and the first time was different from the second time. Yeah. You know, and you just, you just don't know where yeah. he's going to be at and any he, given and, point. And he was, uh, you know, he loved these guys. You know, yeah. you realize people said were, um, my question to these guys, I said, were you ever intimidated by the artist, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these big, you know, artists? And they said, no, 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 not at all. I, the only ones you might be, a, not intimidated, but a little more on your toes mm -hmm. is Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, That's Frank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, they, Frank's older than them. Exactly. But when 1960, Dad's 30, and I think yeah, yeah. Brian's maybe 19. The, these bands don't have their chops to be in the studio to be able to play their instruments at that point. They, they're maybe good musicians, but there's a different, there was a different mentality in the studio. You can't just like record it and nail it. Um, so they looked up to these guys. Yeah, yeah. They were, someone said, were they upset they weren't stars? They were stars. They were stars among the stars and stars among themselves. You know, there's nothing better from getting like, oh my God, did you hear that? What he just did? Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, praise from your peers is better than anything. And that's another interesting thing in the film is that, you know, a lot of these artists, you know, a lot of people were surprised, I'm sure, when they saw this film, how many of those songs that they grew up with in the 60s yeah. and 70s, where they weren't hearing the band members actually play the tracks. Yeah, it, you know? that was just part of the business. It had yeah. to be done that way because you didn't have time. It was a business. Rock and roll, when Top 40 started happening, Radio really pushed the albums. That started pushing the record companies to put out more. They wanted to get into that top 40. So you had to push out more content to get it. Well, a lot of these groups, they could be demos, they were, uh, they're okay, but let's put our guys in, let's nail it. Exactly. Uh, there were make-believe groups. Right. Mar Marquettes, the routers, the T-Bones. T-Bones, T-Bones yeah. is a perfect example. Yeah. It's a commercial. Joe Saraceno, the producer, takes that spot, of the Elka Seltzer commercial, yeah brings the guys and brings dad and Leon and Earl and or Hal and they just nail it. Now it's a T, and then what do we call it? What do we, what name do we have on the right. uh, T-Bones? Call it T-Bones. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Then they cast the they group. They probably had a T-Bone steak or something. Exactly. Seriously, exactly. that's how those yeah. things come up. And they just cast the group. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the Marquettes, the Routers and the T-Bones are groups uh, in the studio, it's the same guys. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. dad, Leon, uh, Hal or Earl, 
and they would just do these things. And that's, and that's how things were done in, in all the cities. I mean, I think in yeah. uh, New York. the same people that did um, uh, um, uh, Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, you know, mm -hmm. or the Pipkins. Right. You know, that did Gimme Dat Ding. Wow. You know what I mean? And it's, it, that's how it was. Like, you it, know, what, you, somebody gets an idea and you just kind of roll with it. It had to be that way. Now, uh, we talked about Hal Blaine, who uh, we talked He's about Earl from, Palmer, those phenomenal. Those two are the most, you know, uh, those two of them are some of the greatest. They created so much, so much uh, history. Mm -hmm. um, there was a great drummer of today, Mark Schulman, said to me, he said, you know, you could hate everything Earl and Hal ever did, or even never heard anything from them but you can't say you weren't influenced by them. He says, because someone influenced you to play. Well, they learned from those guys. Someone learned from those guys. They created things that, you know, fills and shuffles and all that. That was what, that's how they did it. And I stood behind James Burton on stage yeah. uh, one time um, in Memphis. It was a party for Jerry Lee Lewis. And right. he just, he had no idea what Jerry Lee was gonna play next. Yeah. And I, and I saw it in his eyes and he's just like, Oh, that's what he's playing. So he just immediately goes yeah. into because those guys know thousands of songs. Yeah, yeah. And it's just it's just amazing. And there's also um, uh, Carol Kay. Carol Kay was the only woman in the group. Yeah. She was a guitar player first, and then there was an opening for uh, a bass one time, and she happened to be you know she grabbed it and started playing it, and then she kind of went in that direction. Yeah. So she became the Fender bass player of you know the mid '60s on. And, and she uh, played guitar too. Like she did play she, guitar. Did she play guitar on uh, on uh, La Bamba? I believe she did. Uh, she played on uh, I think Don. It's not on La Bamba according to the contracts, but she did uh, play with Richie Valens and Delphi Records. With, okay. Yeah. Wow. And um, but that would have been uh, Ricky um, uh, Richie. Richie. Actually, he actually, actually played yeah. the guitar. Uh, Earl Palmer's on that. Wow. And um, but they did so much. There's also uh, Don Randy. Don Randy, who was a piano There was four, four or five piano players. You had Don Randy, Al DeLore, Leon Russell, uh, Michelle Rubini. Um, he and uh, who else? Um, and Plaz, Plaz Johnson actually played the sax on the Pink, Pink Panther. Panther theme, right? Yep, yeah. Plaz comes out. And actually, his brother it's was Plaz. A, Plaz, yeah. yeah. And he, his brother actually was an, another piano player as well. And then Don Peak. Don Peak's another guitar player. Let's let's watch a, a clip now. Oh, yeah. And and this John is, is going to play. Well, let me don't tell him what oh, yeah. they're going to oh, play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 1972. I get a call from Ben Barrett at the beginning of the year. Hey Don, listen, Motown is moving from Detroit, and they want a band, and I want you to be a staff musician. I said, great, I love it. So I showed up, and um, Freddie Perrin called us over to his studio, and he had written out this incredible chart, and it was. Uh, was I Want You Back, and it was uh... And then David T comes in. So that was written out, and, and I read that. And, and uh, Freddie Perrin had the, the bass an octave lower, and that was a, a hit record. It was a big hit for the Jackson Five. And, um, and then one day I went in there and Marvin Gaye was there. And we started rehearsing this song. Renee Hall was the arranger. And it was in E flat. And um, it was like a... So I wasn't playing the wall wall yet. It was like... And, and Renee says, why don't you make something up at the beginning? So I did, I did this. saying, let's get it on. And that's how that happened. What you were going to, to say about... Well, uh, it was, when we were editing, there's a few things in the early days with Claire 
Um, one of the things that people, one of the guys, a good friend, Grady Cooper said, you got to have more of that playing because Carol always had a good, you know, yeah. bass in her hand or guitar and she yeah. would always play and everybody was interested in that. I said, oh boy, how are we going to do that? So I thought, I put Hal in the studio and it made sense. Hal only, I want people to hear the drum beat. Let's let him hear the drum first, not know what it is, and then we'll feed him, the, we'll be feeding music, not knowing what he's playing to. And that's how we started fading music in to get across what some of his great, you know, like Be My Baby is Hal. Wow. You know, that bump, bump, bump. Um, and then did it with uh, Chuck Berghoffer, did it with uh, Joe Osborne. And with Don Peak, every time I hear him do the wah wah, it just makes my skin just I know. Pop. It's just to actually hear that track, I mean. You and know. that's the thing is, like, people just assume the biggest, um, uh, oh God, the worst thing you can ever hear someone say, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to learn how to read, or I, it'll, you know, stifle my creativity. <laughs> exactly. Is, it's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> um, but, you know, these guys, used, you know, it was up to them, not just, my father said, in the, even in the movie, he says, here, there's a piece of music, it doesn't mean that's music, it's what you put into it. That's right. You have to play it, you have to play it and make it right and make it sing. Exactly. It doesn't mean it's going to be music until you do it. Billy Strange. Another great guitar well, uh, He's player. got an interesting, and he, didn't he uh, uh, write uh, Limbo Rock for Chubby Checker? Oh, I don't know, I don't know about that, did he? Yeah, I think he did. Wow. And he, uh, didn't he play the guitar on the Munsters TV show? Thing no, that was actually Jack Marshall. That was Jack Marshall that played that. Yeah, because uh, Jack Marshall, I think, wrote that. Wow, wow. Yeah. But he, was he considered one of the Wrecking Crew? You know, uh, Jack, Jack would, well, and then, uh, who, again, yeah, who's yeah. going to be part of the Wrecking Crew? It, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It could, um, it could but be no, Jack people, was right? one of the, you know, his son, mm -hmm. um, his son, you know, the, oh my God, totally went blank. The great producer, Spielberg's producer, helped me out. Uh, oh, Frank Marshall. Frank Marshall. Frank Marshall is his son, and he said to me, he was telling me a story about his dad. They, you know, he had one of those, look at him, one of those rock and roll horrible hits, you know, but it became a hit. So now he has to figure out, oh, great, I got to put a band together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had his kid, Frank, and his friends put a band together, took him to Sacramento to go play in an uh, outside concert. And, f and Jack's behind the screen playing the solo. Oh, wow. wow. You know, you know the old man out there, they sort of just <laughs> yeah. had these kids playing. I was like, oh, that's phenomenal. You know, that, but that's what it was. That's, there's so many different stories. Yeah. You can make multiple movies here for yeah. sure. Um, now, let's see, there's, there's also producers. Uh, producers Herb, Herb I mean, Alpert is well, in the Herb film. Well, you know, Herb uh, Alpert, you know, his, you know, obviously was an artist first. Yes, uh, you know, yes. And A&M Records and... Um, I have him in it and Lou Adler together. They yes. were, I didn't realize they were so close when I, until I started working with them. That they were close friends? Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. very close. They were actually, they were Janet Dean's first producer. Wow. And, I didn't know uh, that. They learned from Sam Cooke. Wow. So he was talking about how Sam Cooke taught him everything. And Bums Blackwell and all these guys. Um, H.P. Barnum. H.P. Barnum, another phenomenal interview. And, and, and Snuff Garrett. Snuff Garrett, uh, one of my favorite interviews, and Snuff just passed away two weeks ago. Yes, and we'll see a clip here yeah. in a second. But he was the kind of guy that was really about the business. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, um, Snuff came out of Dallas in radio, came out here, he got a job at Liberty Records, which was an amazing, they were doing a record a day at Liberty Records for weeks. Wow. A record a, a day. Record a, a day. day. So we, so we're Jana talking Dean, an album Vicky or a Carr single? Album, or wow. you know, they could knock them out. Wow. That might have been singles, but it was like every day. Here's uh, Snuff in his own words talking oh, about there's nothing better his, uh, his career as a producer in Hollywood. Yeah. I came to LA to work, I went from in a little town in Texas there, I was making about $350 a week. It was a lot of money for a kid, you know? And I was making $350 a week, and I quit that and went to Liberty Records doing local promotion in L.A. for $90 a week. And uh, it took me about six months to talk him in and let me produce a record. So I guess I was such a lousy promotion man that they uh, Decided to let him try this. If that don't work out, we can get rid of his ass. I get, I'm sure that was the thought. And uh, so I started out, Soundworker taught me right. Uh, uh, started out, you know, cleaning up tapes. And they had a big act in those days called Martin Denny. It was exotic sounds from Hawaii, piano player. And uh, so I'd put in the bird, the bird sounds and the cuckoos and all that stuff. 
start out doing stuff like that because I didn't know one note from another. I don't know any music. And between country and pop, I had 50 top 10 records. And uh, I've always thought, boy, if I knew music, I could have really had a lot of hits, you know. But then I thought, if I knew music, I might not have had any hits either, you know. It's just a different way of hearing. I was always interested in the songs. Because uh, I'm, I'm making a record, and what makes a record, just like it makes a film or a television show or anything else, is the script. And the, the song is, was always the most important thing to me. I think a song can be played badly, but if it's a good enough song, it can be a, can be a hit, you know? See, records were never, ever in my lifetime ascetic to me. I never, I never thought that we were, had a hammer and a chisel and I was chiseling anything in stone that was gonna last, last for a billion years, you know. I was making records for people to buy and we'd like to sell them to you. That's all I made records for. If you like that, hell, buy it, you know. If you don't like it, I'm not here to tell you that this is better than any damn Mario Lanza record I ever heard. Uh, because it, it was, I never went for the aesthetics of making records. And a lot of people do, and I respect them. I listen to them, and I enjoy them. But that was not my way. My way was to make records for people to listen to. Interesting character. Oh my God, um, you know he was. Some people also think I we hung out and we knew everybody, you know, like all the musicians. I didn't know any of the musicians until I started. I mean, I knew their names, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I never met Don Randy. Maybe once or twice in my lifetime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Carol, I don't think I ever met until we started filming. Uh, Snuff was the only guy I met because Dad didn't. They were f good friends and they were gamblers. Oh, really? <laughs> so if there was a card game, Snuff was there. Yeah, wow. wow. Uh, and they could gamble on, like he said, on anything. It, it could be a raindrop where it's going to hit. Wow. Um, but he was the opposite of, you know, an artistic producer. When I say artistic producer, who's, like he said, I'm in a business. My job is to get in and get out and get a hit. So if, if there was any complaints about Snuff, it might have been, well, I could have done another take. I wish it would have, you know. Snuff says, I, I got it. It's good, move on. And he had the best working for him. He had Ernie Freeman as the great arranger. Earl Palmer was doing a lot of his work. Dad was doing the 50 guitars of Tommy Garrett, which is uh, yes. the, that, yeah. and that was my dad on the guitar. Tommy yeah. Garrett, who is snuff, yeah, yeah. can't play a note. That's right, exactly. Yeah. That's right, that's why he mentioned that he really wasn't a musician. No. So we have to, uh, man, there's so many stories, the monkeys, and monkeys, you know, well, yeah, the monkeys, uh, you know, like it's, they, people thought, you know, that was the big, you know, you know, the fall, but it wasn't. It's just, that it was just part of the business. You know, even Mickey Dolan said he was surprised it even happened. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knew it was a TV show. Why, why was there such a, you know? And, and the great story of the flying Telecaster, Michael Nesmith recording session. Michael Nesmith session. put together a session on a weekend. It was a Saturday, Sunday. It, it, um, uh, Shorty Rogers, the great arranger, put together his music with a big, huge band. Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine and James Burton and Dad and everybody was there. And uh, he asked my dad, to, or he asked everybody, just go crazy on the end of the song. Well, don't give that opening to my father. <laughs> That's not something you tell my father. And at the end of the song, the guitar went up flying in the air and came crashing down. <laughs> and that ended up in the final recording. Yeah, right? you hear yeah. it at the end of the recording. What's the name of the song? Oh, I don't remember. remember. It's off the uh, Wichita, uh, Wichita Whistle is the album. Wichita Whistle, wow. Yeah. But it's an outtake on the on the actual uh, DVD. I know, and I actually, uh, great. I'll definitely yeah. look for that. Um, then Frank Zappa. What, Frank what Zappa was, you know, Frank always, you know, my father met Frank on Lumpy Gravy. Oh, he did? Yeah. He played That's on Lumpy, Lumpy Gravy. gravy. Oh, and my oh. father, again, thought, oh, Frank's going to be, you know, this crazy rock and roller. 
you know, so my father dressed up in a little Boy Scout outfit or whatever he <laughs> as a joke. And as Emil Richards says in the DVD, he says, you, you know, Tommy and I and all of us thought, oh, this is gonna be a joke. And it was like, oh God, it's hard. You know, Frank was a, a hard, you know, writing his composing was very difficult. So, but Frank knew what he wanted. So my father had newfound respect for Frank and they became really good friends years later. That's awesome. Um, and also, I mean, of course, we talked about Sam Cooke, and we talked about, uh, yeah. I think we talked about Ricky Nelson. Did we not yeah, talk Ricky about Ricky Nelson? Nelson was, yeah. you know, and that was where Joe Osborne um, was working out here. Uh, you know, we came out because of Ricky. Um, he had, uh, uh, Dad did uh, Fool's Rush In, which, and James Burton's on that. Um, a traveling Man. Yes. It was a great song that yeah. Jerry Fuller wrote. Um, it was just happened to be on Ricky. Ricky's he took it, and it was supposed to be for Sam Cooke originally. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, I'm sure it would have sounded a lot different, it, yeah. too. Yeah, and it's actually, uh, you know, um, Jerry Fuller told a great story about that, how Joe Osborne saved it from uh, the trash. So it's a, wow. Yeah. And um, and your father was on uh, The Gong Show. The Gong Show was, what, a, it was supposed to be as a joke. He went yeah, on yeah. to tease his, he had done Wasn't a, he wearing like a little a tutu? tutu. <laughs> he, he basically, all those years he was winning uh, in the early 70s, Neris, which is the recording academy, would always, they would say, are the best studio guitar player, the best studio this, the best studio. And he was winning like four or five years in a row, he won you know, the top guitar player. And then the, la the one year Larry Carlton won. So dad was giving Larry the, um, the award that year. So my dad sang a song about uh, the Requiem to a studio guitar player. It was in the 50s I was something, in the 60s I was like a king. Now the 70s are rolled around, my name don't mean a thing. And that was the opening, and then he would talk about all the guitar players, Barney Kessel, Howard wow. Roberts, and wow. it was a joke among his friends. That's great. So he did that on the gong show, just the opening part and as a joke, but didn't realize how serious it had to be. You know? Oh, wow, wow. Well, meaning like he had a high, he, they had to keep him in the room, you know. <laughs> and then he came out in two two. That's hilarious. And then he won. So he did win. Oh yeah! Wow, that's fantastic. He got a Gong Show trophy, a, a, a massage sprayer. Well, when we uh, this is the end of uh, an, another great uh, uh, episode with uh, uh, Danny Tedesco, and we will continue in another segment, another episode. This is nice wonder you're watching the Now Man Show here with Danny Tedesco the producer of The Wrecking Crew.